The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and uses the imaginary Airzatz Coffee Shop as its platform to bring you a conversation about a plethora of scintillating topics. We don't shy away from any issue that is plaguing our culture or the church today, whether it's current cultural issues, questions about Bible verses, or even just some banter to encourage you. Dr. Jay Christensen is the Truth Barista, and he and amazing Larry Kutzler brew up highly caffeinated conversations for our day. Grab a cup of joe, pop yourself down in the booth next to us, and get ready to think. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry, and it's listener-supported. For more information about The Truth Barista, go to highbeamministry.com. Thanks for listening. And the Bible teaches that God hates pride. He loves humility. All the way through the scriptures, pride is listed as one of the greatest of all sins. The scripture says in Proverbs 17, And he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. Obadiah 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, I will bring you down, saith the Lord. Dr. J, once again, we're going to probably finish up this itsy-bitsy book called Obadiah, but my goodness, before we turn the microphones on, we were talking about, my goodness, look how much stuff that we found in, in this little book. I mean, we've got five programs that we have done on, <laughs> on Obadiah, and it just keeps coming and coming and coming. Yep. And next week, we're going to start Psalm 119. No, just <laughs> yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah, we'll be on it for five years, at least. <laughs> yes, yes, you probably. Well, I'm teaching uh, an online class through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Seriously, we've been, I, I used to do it one Torah portion at a time. We'd get it done in a year, right? Well, they said, slow down, let's walk through this material. It's great stuff. Well, it's been two and a half years, and <laughs> we're at Deuteronomy 18. Almost done. <laughs> it, it does take time when you do it that way. So let yeah. me ask this question as we begin. As I was listening to you last week, it seems to me that as this judgment was unfolding to Edom, and you used a German word, uh, what was it again? Schadenfreude. Yeah, which is uh, taking pleasure in somebody else's displeasure. The unreeling of a culture happens when judgment begins. And we see that piece by piece, God said, I'm going to take this away, I'm going to take this away, and I'm going to take this away. And as I heard you say that, I'm thinking of our own country, America, and we've seen that happen, you know, over the course of the last decade or two, we've seen so many freedoms taken or so many changes made that it almost makes America, well, different than what we're used to. And I think it could be uh, under that same principle. What do you say? I think that's very true. In fact, let me do a brief recap. And I may be jumping the gun here, but I think it's time for it. Okay. Okay. So we were focusing on Edom and we said, okay, so what did they take pride in? Well, number one, their secure location because they were up on the, the heights south of the Dead Sea. Okay. Number two, they took pride in their wealth. Very good. They took pride in their allies. Very good. They took pride in their wisdom. Also a good thing, huh? And they took pride in their military. I'll tell you what, as I went through this list, I was thinking of the United States. Do we take pride in our secure location? Yes. Do we take pride in our wealth? Yes. Do we take pride that we have so many allies? Yes. Do we take pride in our so-called wisdom? Yes. Do we take pride in our military? Yes. Well, as I look at this, and the second half of Obadiah talks about God's judgment on the nations, and I'm thinking, would God judge us, or are we already under his judgment for our pride in our location, our wealth, our allies, and our wisdom, and our military, rather than being proud that we're serving God? God says in other parts in Scripture, I believe it's Jeremiah, don't let the person boast in his strength or boast in the horse, but let him who boasts boast in the Lord. And I fear for our nation right now. Now, I know the media makes it look like the nation just is totally enamored with leftist principles and just loves the fact that Mickey Mouse is transitioning to Minnie Mouse and they're probably going to have a lesbian affair and all this really bizarre stuff that's going on. But I'm seeing the kickback against that. And there are a lot of people in the United States that aren't buying this. And they're beginning to step up and say, no, 
Our boast is in the Lord. We will not capitulate to this. We are forsaking our pride, and we do not want to fall. So I, I think really right now, the United States is kind of on, if you want to say it, a prophetic judgment knife edge. In which way is it going to fall? I'm not sure. But if you go by Obadiah's predictions here, what he's saying against Edom, man, we're in the same position, which should shock us into the the point of saying, Lord, forgive us. In other words, like we said last week, refuse to punish us for these things. Let these things be cleansed from us and help us to humble ourselves and use what we have, our allies, our wealth, our location, all of these things to help the world and not hurt it. What do you think? I love it. You're right on. You know, I had a conversation with a pastor not long ago, and they were telling me that they do what they are calling posturing. And of course, that was a word I hadn't heard before, at least in in reference to a church ministry or an outlook. And posturing, from what I can gather, is to step back like a participant and see what's going on on the playing floor. You know, it's not sure which way to go, so we're not going to do anything anything. We're just going to sit back and watch and see what happens. I felt in my heart that there's something wrong with that because a lot of times the church has taken that position. The church in the 30s in Germany did that and look what happened. And I said, well, what about the moral voice in society? I mean, I realize our message is Christ and him crucified and all of that. And that is number one. I want to make that clear. However, there is a moral voice that we as believers, have to give into the world. And here's why, Dr. J. What other moral entity is there? Where will there people isn't. get? That's correct. So when you're posturing and pulling back into your own little silos, what happens? The society continues to go astray to a point where it gets darker and darker. So we do have a responsibility. What do you say? Right. Well, with no due respect to the pastor that said that, that would be like me riding on a bus and the driver gets a heart attack and suddenly the bus is heading toward the intersection and it's a red light. Now, I could sit back in the front seat and go, well, you know, let's see how this turns out. I'm just going to posture for a while. <laughs> no, the minute something happens, there must be an immediate response to it. Otherwise, if there's not, so for example, in the cultural realm, you have somebody who steps up, a man who finds it absolutely necessary to dress in a very provocative, revealing, and quite skanky, horrible way and dance in front of small children. The first time that happened, the church should have stood up and said, get the heck out of our library. That is not right. Leave. That's what should have happened. But if the church sits back and postures and says, hmm, that certainly was repulsive, but Let's see where this goes. <laughs> You're <laughs> just going to get more of it. And you are just as culpable for what's happening because you did nothing to step in and stop it. That's the message behind Eric Metaxas' book, Letter to the American Church. Correct. And that's the problem that happened in Germany and around the world when these despots and these others step up to, you know, to fundamentally change, you know, the United States from a moral God-fearing country to a cesspool, you got to step up immediately. Otherwise, God will hold you culpable for not stepping in. That's my take on it. Well, I love it, Dr. J. I mean, I hate to get on rabbit trails like this, but I think sometimes, you know, the book we're studying, Obadiah, kind of tells us some things about judgment and so forth. And, you know, we, we need to stand up in days like our days of dark days and, and be the light. So enough said on that. Let's get back to Obadiah. Right. And the segue to that is, as it's not good for people to sit back and posture, this is one of the indictments against Obadiah. He was saying, Obadiah, these are your brothers. You should have helped them in their time of need. You should have not taken pleasure in your brother's calamity. Verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster and do not take their possessions in the day of their disaster. In other words, don't take their stuff. In fact, what Edom should have done is protected what was left there until the Judahites could be returned. Now, they didn't know when they would come back. They'd been taken prisoners to Babylon, but Obadiah read Edom correctly. Oh, this is our chance to get all this stuff that really belongs to us, the firstborn nation between the two brothers. So let's take it. And God goes, uh-uh. That's not good. Verse 14, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off the fugitives and do not hand over the survivors in the day of distress. This right here is the lowest 
of the low. This is the climax of God's indictment against Edom. He's saying, you not only refuse to help your kin, you helped their enemies by cutting off Jacob's escape, and you handed them over to the Babylonians. Hmm. You even took part in harming your kin. And that is despicable. Wow. You feel that just the, <laughs> the pounding of God's oh, gavel my goodness. on that indictment. But that is also, just to go back a few moments ago, posturing is just that. You don't do anything to be a moral voice in society. Well, you're helping then the darkness succeed. Same thing, same principle. Right, right. Okay, so moving on here, verse 15 toward the end. Remember when I said that Edom became a symbol for the nations. Just as Edom is related to Israel, so the nations are related to Israel and that we're all part of humanity. So now Obadiah's scope begins to widen and says, well, just as the Lord is going after Edom, so the Lord will also go after the nations because the nations are doing the same kind of things against his people, Israel. Verse 15, here's the key. The Hebrew idiom, for the day of the Lord is near. That's a day when God will step into human history and do something to begin to transition from human dominion on earth to the messianic kingdom, to God's dominion on earth. We know from the book of Daniel that there will be a succession of empires on the earth, and there will be one final very vicious, terrible empire that will basically run roughshod through the earth, and then Jesus will appear and strike that nation down, that empire down, and God's kingdom will begin. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, I want to just point out that the day of the Lord is different than his return. I think they're, they're two separate events. You know, if we want to say that the return is more about the rapture and on taking away, but the day of the Lord is more judgment. Am I correct? Right. That is correct. And the return is within this time period called the day of the Lord. Right. And because it's a day, it's a sh relatively short period of time that that will happen. It is interesting because when you look at Joel, he talks about the day of the Lord and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a symbol of the day of the Lord. Well, that means the day of the Lord started almost 2000 years ago. Wow. <laughs> and yet, if you look at the, you know, it's like in the last days, we're in the last days and have been for about 2000 years. However, when you look at other scriptures, it talks about the day of the Lord. This is the transition point that most people would talk about as the tribulation. And the tribulation ends with Jesus' return. So, you're right. The return is part of the day of the Lord. So, here, Obadiah's phrase, the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. Now, in the near term, it could be the day of the Lord is the day of the Lord's judgment against the nations, etc. And it may just be a moment here. Or it may be the end time day of the Lord judgment, which is what the context seems to point to. All right. Obadiah's vision kind of now leaves forward to the day of the Lord judgment day. And as we talked about biblically, this is the day that Jesus returns to do what? He defeats Israel's enemies and establishes his kingdom on earth. What's he talking about to Edom? I'm going to defeat Israel's enemy, Edom, and then I'm going to return my people back to the land and reestablish them as a nation. And during this messianic kingdom of the end, Israel will become the head of all nations on earth. And what will happen? This prophecy against Edom for attacking Israel also becomes a warning to all nations. God's covenant with Abraham is still in effect, amazing Larry. God will mistreat the nations who have mistreated Israel. On the flip side, those who bless Israel will be blessed. So the question is, which would you prefer to be? Now, let me throw this at you. Do you remember when it says in Matthew, when I come, Jesus is talking, when I return and sit on my throne, all the angels will be with me, and I will assemble the nations before me, and I will separate the sheep and the goats. Now, in most interpretations of sheep and goats, we think that's people. In context, no, that's nations. He's going to separate the nations that fed, clothed, healed, and visited his people in their difficulty, as opposed to the nations who didn't. So, in a sense, the sheep and the goat parable is about national payback. It's not individual payback. It's punishment reward on a national level, not punishment and reward on an individual level. You see where I'm going with that? Well, you know, I think that's very common in the Messianic movement, right? That interpretation. I, I would agree with you 100%. I think that's what it means because he talks there specifically about my brethren. It's Jesus. It's my brethren. It's the Jews. Yeah. 
He's a Jew. Yeah. He's a Jew. They're his family. And you know, you stand up for your family. That's what you do. And that's what Edom should have done with Jacob. I'm just saying. Go ahead. I'm just saying. Anyway, I want to come back to a statement you just made. Israel will be the head of the all nations. Well, where does the church fit into that? It sounds like you're identifying Israel as being the, the main player in this end times and not the church. I, I don't think you mean that, but kind of clarify that for us. Israel, head of all the nations, where is the church? Okay. Geopolitically, because of the United States' wealth and military strength, et cetera, et cetera, we kind of look at the United States as the head of the nations, all right? And coming from a person who's a United States citizen, that can be quite an ethnocentric proposal. But, hey, there are a lot of people that want to come to the United States, so evidently we must be in that type of a position. So as, as far as the end times, the Messianic kingdom, because Jesus is ruling from a throne in Jerusalem, in the nation of Israel, reborn, Israel will have such strength and power and wealth that it will have great influence over the rest of the world and will be actually be leading a leader among the nations. Where will the church be? All over the world. It will be people who have given their lives from every tribe, nation, tongue, language, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. That's where the church is. And if you look at some of the scriptures, we'll actually be designated by Jesus to help lead various aspects of our various nations and cities and whatever. In fact, it'll be very much, I believe, like today without the corruption of Washington. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> wow, was that a political statement or what? <laughs> well, I don't really care at this point in my life. <laughs> you wow. know, corruption is corruption. Yeah, just, no, imagine I, uh, what yeah. it would be like to have a nation where you didn't have corrupt politicians and people, you know, wrecking other people's lives just to put money in their own pockets for crying out loud i mean it's like you want to talk about heaven on earth that's exactly what it's going to be like well i appreciate you clarifying that because i think you know our relationship with israel you know it, it is our elder brother we we need to really honor israel and see how important she is in scripture not just what has been but what will be and i think that's right. what we have to open our eyes to Right. And Israel is not perfect. I get that. They're still a nation led by human beings. But we do need, in principle, to support the nation and to speak and to act relative to how they're behaving as well. So there's certainly room for that. Okay, so back to the scriptures here. Because of this verse, verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near against all the nations, Edom has become a symbol for the nations that stand against Israel. And so this is where Obadiah is going here. Rome, by the way in its day was referred to as Edom because Rome as an empire opposed the Jewish people in many ways. It controlled Judea in the time of Jesus. So it became kind of like a focal point of scorn, so to speak. It's, man, those Edomites over there in Italy. <laughs> you say that, that's a loaded phrase to a Jewish person. You know, they're, they're out to get us. They hate us. They don't want to have anything to do with us. They want to take our stuff, etc. Okay, well, because the Roman Empire also embraced Christianity and melded with it into a holy Roman Empire, the church itself has sometimes been called Edom by certain elements within the Jewish community. Why? You look at replacement theology. We're going to kick the Jews when they're down. We're going to take their stuff. We're going to appropriate their land. We're going to appropriate their promises and their prophecies and all these things because it belongs to the church now. No, it doesn't. That's a very Edomite thing to do. We need to separate that. God has promises to us as his sons and daughters in Jesus. He still has promises to the other side of the family. And all this stuff is going to work together at the end. Go ahead, sir. Well, I want to just clarify for our audience who may never have heard that term, replacement theology. The theological term is supersessionism. Can you give just a, a 60 second soundbite? You sort of did there, but, you know, what is replacement theology for someone who wouldn't know that term? Well, supersessionism comes oftentimes from Paul's statement that you are the new Israel, you're the Israel of God. And so it gave the impression that. Okay, since the Jews disobeyed God and rejected Jesus as the Messiah, God says, I'm done with you Jews, get out! I'm now going to make a people out of believing Jews and Gentiles, and those will be my new Israel. And since Israel was destroyed as a nation in AD 70, people said, aha, see, those Jews over there, they're getting punished by God and God's wiping them out. The church supersedes 
the Jews and the nation of Israel. All that came to a crashing halt in 1948 when God pulled the Jews out of the world and reconstituted the nation of Israel and gave them Jerusalem back in 1967. So supersessionism doesn't hold any water, except people still believe aspects of it. Okay, so here we go, back to the text. In verse 15, God is going to turn the table on the nations. As you have done, you nations, so it will be done to you. That's the Obadiah word against Edom. What you deserve will return on your head. It's payback time, measure for measure, and you brought this on yourself. Okay, verse 16, as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down and be as though they had never been. In other words, he's talking about the cup of God's wrath. He's going to serve you up some wonderful judgment. You get to drain it to the end. This is his judgment against sin and unrighteousness. It, his cup at this time in 586 BC, he had passed that to the Jews, the Judeans, because of their sin. Well, now that they're out of the land and in Babylon, he's taking the cup and he's passing it to Edom. Well, prophetically, he's going, and at the end, that cup gets to go to all the nations that are opposing Israel. They get to drink. And by the way, you see the woman in the book of Revelation with a cup in her hands. Okay, it's filled with all sorts of impurity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's also going to be the cup of God's wrath. Still regarded the Jews as his own people and the land, the city, and the temple, where it says, my holy mountain, right here. You drank your fill of my people, so there's coming a time when you will get your fill of my judgment, verse 17. But there will be deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. In other words, set apart for the Lord and his people, the Jews. The house of Jacob will dispossess them and dispossess those who dispossessed them. This now points back to the beginning, to the struggle over the birthright and the blessing. So in our day, Israel has regained physical and spiritual blessings. So my question is, are we on the cusp of the day of the Lord? Despite how Jacob gained the birthright and blessing, it was God's intention to give it to Jacob all along, and he'll make sure that Israel holds it, and he will defend it for Israel. And Jacob did indeed pay for his deeds. Remember wrestling with uh, Laban in Genesis 29 through 31 and wrestling with the angel, Genesis 32? You're right. Jacob had to pay for how he usurped that blessing. Well, now it belongs to him. God says it belongs to him. God is going to protect it. Verse 18, then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire and the house of Joseph a burning flame, but the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will set them on fire and consume Edom. Therefore, no survival will remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. In other words, God will reunite the north, Joseph, and the south, Jacob, because his word includes the whole house of Israel. Once both houses are back in their land and regaining their inheritance, God will use them to execute his judgment on Edom and the enemy nations. Jacob slash Judah are both reckoned as the firstborn, and it's the responsibility of the firstborn to protect the family. Israel will bring the family tree in line. So what does this mean? Okay, It means that in the end, when the mixed Arab tribes, the descendants of Esau, come against Israel, the Ishmaelites and the Esauites come against Israel, Israel's going to win. And with King Jesus at their head, the family will finally be reunited, and he's going to bring them into line again. And they will affirm that Israel has the birthright and the blessing, not them. But as they accept that, they in turn will be blessed. So there's really going to be, if you look at it that way, an end time blessing for Esau. But right now, Esau and Ishmael are still fighting for this stuff. Are you ready for a really interesting take on this? Well, you have teased that the whole five parts. So yeah, let's get to it. <laughs> Finally. Okay. The final three verses here, people from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the Judean foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria, while Benjamin will possess Gilead. In fact, what he's talking about in these final verses here, 21 and 22, Israel's going to possess, in the end, not only the land of Israel, but Edom, Moab, Ammon. In other words, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon into Syria and portions of Saudi Arabia. Now, here's the cool thing. There was a king in Israel named King Herod. If you go look at his lineage, he is known as an Idumean. Interesting, because in the days that Obadiah wrote this, the Edomites lived on the south side of the Dead Sea. Well, over time, their enemies did attack them, just like Obadiah said, and 
brought this nation down to a very small nation and pushed them westward toward the south of the Negev. This little kingdom produced a king named Herod. The Edomites became the Idumeans. So you have Herod the Great on a throne, and he gets word. Now, he's an Idumean. He is not a king from among the Jews. He is not a king amongst their brothers, like God commanded the Jews. So in essence, Jacob has an Esauite king ruling over them in Jesus' day. And all of a sudden, this group of wise guys probably Jewish scholars from Babylon, show up and say, hey, you know, we've seen this star, and this star is a portent. It's a harbinger of a king of the Jews that's been born. What? A king of the Jews? But wasn't Herod the king of the Jews? Herod is an Edomite. He's claimed the birthright and the blessing, and he used Rome to get there. Why do you think King Herod went after Jesus? Because Jesus, the one to whom the birthright and blessing belongs to, is threatening the usurper sitting on the throne. If you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings movie, in a sense, King Herod is the steward of Gondor, the insane man who wanted to hold on to power and not turn it over to the rightful king. This is the battle of the end between the Antichrist, who seeks the birthright and the blessing, against the true king who's coming against him. And there are some people who believe that the end-time empire and the end-time king will be Islamic of the Ishmaelites. And it's really still a battle over the birthright and the blessing. Who's going to take it? The Antichrist or the Christ? Well, now that's a conclusion. Put on pump, right? Wow. Yeah. So if there's five parts to this Obadiah study, so if you missed any part of it, you can catch it by going to our website at highbeamministry.com. High beams as in car high beams, highbeamministry.com. Go and look for the podcast site, the Truth Barista podcast, because we take the radio show and put it there. Plus, if you want more information about this revelation take on the final empire being Islamic and an Islamic antichrist, check out Cruising Through the Bible and download the revelation section, which would be at the end of the year in the December month. And it, I go into much greater detail there. Okay, until next time, what do you say? I say, be at peace, love the Lord, serve Him well, and keep your eyes looking for Jesus. The Truth Barista is listener-supported and depends on the faithful gifts of people like you. The Truth Barista values the truth, so our conversations will always evaluate how truth impacts what we see or hear in our culture. To learn more about The Truth Barista, go to highbeamministry.com. want the truth today? Dr. Jay Christensen is the truth barista and the founder of High Beam Ministry. Jay is a creative person who wants to use the setting of an imaginary cafe to produce a series of radio and internet programs that confront the issues of our day through the lens of the Bible. The Truth Barista was the avenue that was developed to communicate truth using the Bible as the source of our information. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and can be found online at highbeamministry.com.